Good morning. Um, for today, we will be revisiting the well-known story of the prophet Jonah. But I have renamed him now to the reluctant prophet Jonah. So um, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the story of Jonah. I mean, can you quickly help me summarize the story of Jonah? It starts with God coming to Jonah and saying, Jonah must go. He must go to Nineveh. And I'm hoping the younger members of the congregation will, will help us get through the story of Jonah. So uh, God comes to Jonah and says he must go to Nineveh. And he must pronounce a message. He must spread a message of judgment. Right? He must go there and say judgment. And Jonah, what does he do? He ran away. He ran complete other direction as far as he possibly could go. So what did the Lord do? Ah, he sent a storm. Thank you, Laren. They were struggling to get to it, but you knew. He sent a storm. Now, in the storm, the sailors did everything that they knew, but this storm was going to overcome the boat. And then they decide to do what? Pray. So they pray. Faith was a lost resort. Everyone is praying except, where is Jonah? He is asleep. So finally Jonah wakes up, and they cast lots, and the lot falls on Jonah. So everyone knows that Jonah is the reason for the storm. And what does Jonah say? Do you know the story? You're not overly impressing me. So Jonah says, throw me into the sea. And when Jonah is thrown into the sea, what happens? A whale, A whale Mr. Chan. You're reading some of those new versions of the Bible? <laughs> it says a big fish. <laughs> okay, so a big fish came and swallowed Jonah. How long was Jonah inside the fish? Three days. And then Jonah gets vomited out by the fish... And God comes to him again and says, go to Nineveh. Jonah goes. He says, 40 days then shall the city of Nineveh be destroyed. And what happens next? The king proclaims a fast day. The whole city repents. So uh, I think we'll all agree. This is a bit of a crazy story. Right? A storm, a man thrown into the sea, suddenly the storm subsides. Is that logical? No. A big fish comes and swallows the man. Now, we've heard of fish swallowing humans, usually after a bit of chewing is involved, and then definitely they don't live for three days in the stomach, right? So this story, it's a story, right? And then the most outrageous claim, maybe a fish can swallow a man, maybe he can stay alive, because there's a documented case of a sailor being swallowed by a whale while they were whaling. And they ultimately captured the whale, cut him open, and the man was still alive inside. A bit um, digested, but still alive. So maybe that can still happen. But for a whole city to repent at the preaching of one man. Truly, that is just completely outrageous. So we as a sophisticated, logical, postmodern adults, I mean, can you really believe the claims of this story? Maybe it's just an allegory. Maybe it's just something to tell the kids. Is this a real and a true historical account, the story of Jonah? Well, we could debate at length and try various sources to establish whether this is a real, true historical account or whether this is just an allegory. But personally, I want to save us a lot of trouble and just ask us to page to Luke 11, 29 to 32. Luke 11, 29 to 32, and I will read for us. And Jesus was speaking and he said, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of Jonas the prophet. 
For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man also be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost, part, utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So we can see Jesus is talking and he's saying that this generation in which he found himself during the time of the Jews under the Roman king uh, empire, he says these people will be given no sign but the sign of Jonah. And then he says, as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so he's referring to the events that we're familiar with, Jonah and the Ninevites, but then he also says the queen of Sheba, the queen of the south, who came to listen to Solomon. So in using the queen of the south and Solomon, the reference to real, actual people who had a real historic account, the interaction between the queen of the south and Solomon, Jesus makes it quite clear that he views Solomon and the queen of the south, documented historical figures, he views them as real, and he views Jonah and the Ninevites just as real. Therefore, Jesus' opinion is that the book of Jonah is not an allegory. It's not a story. It is a true historic account. Verse 32, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Did Jesus view the story of Jonas as the history of Jonas? It was a true historical account. So with Jesus' opinion, actually the matter for me is settled. So now that we've established that this is a true story, maybe it sounds a bit far-fetched initially, but with Jesus' endorsement, this is truth. Now I want to bring us back to the book of Jonah. You see, because when I always read this book as a, a child, I felt very uncomfortable. The prophet, the, the prophet Jonah, is disobedient, unloving, and behaving like a spoiled brat most of the time. So why is his book even in the Bible? I mean, it seems God has to work very hard, not through him, but in spite of him. Jonah was not an instrument of God's working. He was an obstruction. He was not a willing servant. He was a deserter. So why do we have this person in the Bible? Why do we call him a prophet? He does not provide us as readers with any evidence of moral or spiritual growth. So why is this book in the Bible? Let us take a fresh look at this book. So first, who was Jonah? We first read of Jonah in the book of 2 Kings 14, verse 25, and it's just a quick reference. In 2 Kings 14, 25, Jeroboam, the king of Israel, restored the coast of Israel from the entering of the Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet which was of gath -hefer. So here in 2 Kings 14.25, we read of Jonah, and the key to knowing that this Jonah is the same Jonah as the book of Jonah is the son of Amittai. Now, what do we think of the Jonah that we read of in 2 Kings? Well, he's a good guy. He's a prophet. He was given a message, and it was a good message. Israel will enlarge their borders. He took this good message, he preached his good message to the good people Israel, and everything is good. Jonah is a good prophet. But then, we need to contrast the Jonah of 2 Kings, the good prophet, preaching the good message to the good people, with the Jonah that we read of in the book of Jonah. So let's start Jonah 1, and we will spend the rest of the day in the book of Jonah. Rest of the sermon, Jonah 1, and reading verses 1 to 3. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. So that's how we know this is the same Jonah as the Jonah from 2 Kings. 
saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, what happened here? We had a good prophet. When he had a good message, he preached it to the good people and everything was good. And now the same prophet, he's given a message, but we see an extreme reaction. Now, how do we explain this extreme reaction? We need to ask ourselves, who are these Ninevites? In Genesis 10, we read that out of the kingdom of Nimrod, in the land Shinar, a man named Asher built the city of Nineveh. And then in 2 Kings 19, and Isaiah 37, we read that the king of the Assyrians had made Nineveh his capital. So this is a very old city, and through the generations now, it is, in the time of Jonah, inhabited by the Assyrians. So who are these Assyrians? Well, we can read the books of 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, and Isaiah. And he tells us one thing, that the Assyrians and the Israelites didn't get along. And these Assyrians were a vicious and brutal people. So our good prophet Jonah has now been commissioned to preach unto this city. And he's not too impressed with the mission. These people are not good people. Why must he, the good prophet Jonah, go to a place like Nineveh, inhabited by Assyrians? A people who Jonah, in his wisdom, has decided surely they must be beyond the mercy of God. Now, Jonah is not interested. Jonah thinks these people don't deserve this message. Jonah thinks, why bother? Jonah, in fact, is so upset by God's direct message to go and preach to these people that he flees from God. Clearly, Jonah has a big problem with the people of Nineveh. Now, when I notice this, then a question comes up and it prompts me. And it is, how many times have we as good Christians, good Seventh-day Adventists, decided on behalf of God, we've decided, that some messages are just too harsh for us to have to bear the discomfort of sharing this message? especially if we have already judged the recipients, the intended recipients of that message, and deemed them unworthy of the truth. How many times do we do that? Have we perhaps been Jonah's, when God has sent us this way, but we went that way, just because we felt some people are not worth the trouble? So Jonah boarded a ship. He headed the wrong way, but God pursued him. God was working on Jonah. Continuing in Jonah 1, from verse 4, The Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest, and the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners fought hard, and they, they were afraid, and cried every man to his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship to lighten them of it. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, what meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. And they said every man to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And Jonah realizes that God is persuading him. God is trying to persuade him to return, but Jonah stubbornly refuses to pray, even when all seemed lost. Now, this is concerning. How can Jonah, who by the Bible was called a prophet of God, how can he be so decidedly unrepentant? Even at the threat of loss of life, he refuses to submit. Even when the drawing of the lots made it apparent that God is pointing to him. You are the reason for this storm. But Jonah refuses to submit. That should be a warning for us as well. We should be very careful and concerned 
when we continue to pursue down a path which God has made very plain to us is not his intended direction for us or our lives. It is possible, and Jesus warns against it, the sin against the Holy Spirit. We need to be careful. Now we continue with Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause is this evil upon us? What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought, and was tempestuous. And Jonah, demonstrating his refusal to submit to God, he would rather accept death. Jonah preferred death to obedience. And this is the shocking truth of the desperately wicked human heart. We need to take heed to the caution from the life of Jonah. And Jonah said, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And here, even in Jonah's rebellion, we find a very unique shadow of Jonah and Jesus. For those familiar with the theological concept of typology, we can see that Jonah here is a type of, type of Christ. Let us compare. Jonah 1 verse 5, we read that Jonah was asleep upon the ship during the storm. And in Mark 4, verse 36 and 39, we read that Jesus was asleep on a ship. Jonah was resolute in his decision to forsake Nineveh and flee from God. And even the storm could not get him to reconsider. That is Jonah's hardened heart. He refuses to submit. We need to compare this with Jesus asleep in the boat. And Jesus was not hardened in his heart, but was fully resigned in faith. He trusted God. This is the difference between them, and this is what we will notice, that Jonah is a type of Christ, but in the opposite. Let us take a closer look. We find that Jonah is an unrepentant, disobedient servant who dies on behalf of pagan people, and really we should take note when these pagan people cry out and say, Lord, do not hold us accountable for this man's blood. He dies on behalf of pagan people who did not want to kill Jonah. But once they realize that they have no other option, this is the sacrifice for to calm the storm. Then they throw him into the sea, and a great fish swallows him, and he spends three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. You see, Jesus was the opposite. Jesus was an obedient servant who died on behalf of all sinners. Jesus died to save these sinners, but Jesus was killed, not by pagans, but by so-called believers. And where the pagans were saying, Lord, don't bring this man's blood on us, what did the Jews cry out? Let his blood come upon us and our children. You see, Jesus and Jonah, in contrast, we can see the typology. Jesus was killed by his own chosen people. These people wanted to kill Jesus. They plotted and schemed to kill him. And once Jesus was killed by these evil people, he remained in the belly of the tomb three days. The parameters of the story were the same, but the characters involved were polar opposites. Jesus fully resigned to his mission as God's servant. Jonah fully resigned in his opposition to his mission. But continuing with Jonah, 
The strange thing is, it seems that Jonah is an effective witness, even in disobedience. The Lord has, through this experience, displayed his power and authority to the pagan sailors. And how do they respond? Jonah 1 verse 16. The men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. So even in Jonah's disobedience, these men were impressed by the power of the God of Israel. Now back to Jonah, who's now in the belly of the fish. We read of this, his experience in the belly of the fish in Jonah, the second chapter. And this is also called the Psalm of Jonah. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about, the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her, with her bars was about me forever. Yes, hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. It is a beautiful song about a beautiful event. God has worked the miracle of repentance in a man's heart. The unfortunate thing is that this man was willing to go all the way to death in his refusal to submit to God. But God took him through this near-death experience for him to recognize that he needs God in his life. And he recognizes the sovereignty of God. Now, I'm always cautious when I come to events like this and I see the miracle of repentance happening because I worry for the number who sit here today who know that there are things that they should be repenting of but are waiting for this Jonah in the fish type experience to then and only then take God seriously. How many are waiting until they are the thief on the cross? to then take God seriously. Brothers and sisters, do not presume upon God's mercy because perhaps in so doing, you would shun the Holy Spirit. We continue in Jonah 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Jonah finally listens to God. He's going to Nineveh. He's going to deliver that message. Jonah enters into the city a day's journey. He cries and says, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Wow. I didn't get an amen. People, we just read that one man walked one day's distance into a city. He said, 40 days, then shall this city be destroyed. And a whole city repented. And it's clear, it's clear why this message is being preached here today. Because we didn't believe it could happen. We sat here, we heard those words, and we just let them pass us by. Because we live in, live in a city. But we don't see these conversions, do we? What a miracle. 
That was so unexpected, so quick. How can a prophet so undeserving receive such an overwhelming response after such an unimpressive attempt? Jonah shows up at Nineveh with the same hateful attitudes in his heart towards the Ninevites. Yes, he will come and bring this message, but he will only preach the judgment. He does not preach salvation. He will just go and tell the Assyrians that they will die. He will not tell them how they will live. However, the Ninevites of their own accord decide that they will fall on the mercy of God and they repent. The king of Nineveh caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. Now, let us compare. For God to convince Jonah to repent required a storm, a fish, and three days. For Nineveh to repent required one message, one day, and an entire city has come to repentance. So how is our friend Jonah doing as a prophet so far? How would you rate Jonah as a prophet? Average. 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 I'm shocked. I'm shocked. If we settle for prophets who are disobedient, and we call them average in this church, I'm worried. I would say Jonah is a fantastic prophet so far. He's got the results. Jonah has got a whole boat full of converts. A whole ship of pagans are now sacrificing to God. And now he's got a whole city of converts. Jonah is extremely successful. And you ask, but how is that possible? And that is the point of the sermon. That is the point of Jonah. Jonah's name means, what does the Hebrew word Jonah mean? Jonah means dove. And dove is a symbol of? If anyone said peace, they need to come and see me afterward. In the Bible, the dove is a, spirit, uh, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And this, Jonah by name, is telling us that it is not Jonah who is gaining these converts. It is the Holy Spirit working. So Jonah is actually a bit irrelevant in that regard. It's the Holy Spirit. So the answer is the Holy Spirit. And the glory does not go to Jonah, who is the successful failure of an evangelist. It is to God be the glory. Jonah 3.10 And God saw their works, the city that are now in sackcloth and ash, and they are repenting. God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. And God responds. And how does God respond? As he always does when people repent. God shows mercy. You see, God is not in the business of ending lives. God is in the business of saving lives. And Jonah would have been happy to see the lives of the Ninevites ended. Not realizing that his life was almost ended in sin. And as God was merciful towards Jonah, God is being merciful to the Ninevites. And that is a message to us about the God we serve. He's a specialist, not in the business of ending lives, but in the business of saving lives. And you know what? If the threat of loss of life is the only way to get us to consider, those are tools that God will not put beyond His use. That is how great His love is for us. 
John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. We serve a Lord who is merciful and gracious, wishing that all should be saved. So does the story of Jonah end there? No. No, we still have a chapter to go. You see, God was not done with saving lives from the destruction that sin will bring. God still had more work to do. Let's read Jonah chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Jonah was upset. God was being gracious and merciful. Jonah is upset. These Ninevites were undeserving of God's pardon, and God has shown mercy. So what does Jonah do? He prayed unto the Lord, and he said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. See, Jonah was still his old self in all of this. He had some real issues in his heart. Jonah hated. He hated these Ninevites. Now, whether he hated the Ninevites because of racial prejudice, we do not know. Whether he had real reason to hate, Say, for example, these Ninevites and their king said, the violence in your hands, they were a violent people. Maybe one of these Ninevites had hurt someone that meant a lot to Jonah and he just could not deal with forgiving the, these people. We don't know. What we do know is Jonah has this cold heart-heartedness. He would rather accuse God of being merciful. What an accusation. Does that make any sense? I know that you are a gracious and a merciful God. What an accusation. How many people go around accusing the Adventists of being merciful and gracious? Just a question. Jonah accuses God that he knew he would be merciful. And Jonah makes it clear he wanted these Ninevites to perish. The question for us today is, do we carry some grudges or prejudices in our hearts? Do we? We carry these grudges. We bathe them, bathe them in the ointment of malice. And we put a plaster of hatred over it and we let it fester. And these issues are preventing us from seeing our fellow man as God's creation and worthy of his forgiveness. And that they might also share in the gift of salvation. And the question is, do we have these issues? Because the Lord might send us to these very people to change our perspectives. And the question is, can the Lord send you? Can the Lord send you to those people? Can the Lord send you to your people? Can the Lord send you anywhere? So where were we with Jonah? Jonah wanted to die because he hated these Ninevites and he was upset with God being merciful. Then the Lord says unto Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord had prepared a gird and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. And Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gird. But God prepared a worm when the morning arose the next day and it smote the gird that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. When I read this book of Jonah, 
I'm just struck by how constantly Jonah is filled with depression and anger and frustration, and he just wants to die. Have you ever come across someone who's just constantly angry and frustrated? And their lives are miserable, and it's God's fault, and it's everyone around them, it's their fault, and everyone should just die. Death is the only solution. They're not concerned about who dies, whether they die or I die, but death is the solution. Brothers and sisters, Jonah is telling us that God is the solution. Death is not the solution. Ending lives is not the solution, but saving lives. Let's give the frustration and the rage to Jesus, exchange it, and experience his mercy and salvation. Continuing verse 9, God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the good? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the good, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. So how much is six score thousand? 120,000. Good math. Good math. You see, God was helping Jonah to put things into perspective. Jonah valued a plant more than 120,000 persons. How many of us have a warped value system where we value our comfort more than 120,000 people? I'm concerned about us who prefer to sit comfortable instead of experiencing the discomfort and the inconvenience of reaching out to our fellow man who we can see is clearly lost. But we decide we would rather sit in the shade and watch from the sidelines than get up and participate in soul-saving ministry. I am concerned. And the story of Jonah is asking us to re-evaluate. And there the book of Jonah ends. And it feels kind of incomplete. Clearly, Jonah was successful. The city of Nineveh is in repentance. But chapter 4 leaves me with questions about Jonah. And we just don't get those answers from the book of Jonah. Now, the obvious message of the book of Jonah is that God wanted to save Nineveh. That is very clear. What was unexpected, though, is that the unbelievers, or the wicked people, they were more ready to repent a sincere and true repentance than the so-called prophet. And we see this, actually, in our day and age as well. You see, we have some people who make some bad choices in their life. They end up in some damaging and destructive habits or places or they suffer the consequences of some sinful decisions. And they know, they know they need God. And when someone presents God to them, they accept it. Why? Because they need God. And then they join to a church. But then, you see, then we see the so-called believers who say, yeah, it's typical. People who make decisions like that, they always get carried away. Then they come into church, they're very exuberant and enthusiastic. Don't worry, it'll calm down. And you see these enthusiastic young believers who were former wayward sinners, they treasure what they found in God and they're excited. But the comfortable sedate group of so-called believers, the frozen chosen, will just shut them out and judge them and say that is typical. Typical over-exuberance, typical behavior. Instead of reaching out that warm embrace and saying welcome to the house of God. And you see Jonah, Jonah the so-called believer, doesn't realize he's lost as a Jew. 
Whereas those who were lost realized they were lost and were ready to repent and surrender all. And how many of us sit here today, born into the privilege of being an Adventist, but do not respond with that full surrender while we have the opportunity? But instead, we go on the relative scale of, I'm relatively better than that person and therefore I'm okay. Jonah is asking some very hard questions. And I wish there are people here today who will be honest enough to look at their lives and seek for the answers to these questions. That was the obvious message of the book of Jonah. The less obvious message is that Jonah needed the saving. He needed to be saved from the hardness of his heart, from the limits he set to God's mercy. The overriding truth, though, is that God loved both Jonah and Nineveh equally. God was long-suffering towards both. But who had the greater excuse for their sin? The book ends in this open-ended fashion, and it begs of us, the readers, how do we value life? What do we value more than our fellow man? Now, whether I'm a good preacher or not is for you to decide. But a friend once said that a good preacher knows how to make the uncomfortable feel a bit more comfortable in church and how to make the comfortable feel a bit uncomfortable in church. Now, I don't know where you find yourself today, but I want to say the book of Jonah is forcing you to establish where am I? Am I in, on my way into the church of God to experience the salvation and to experience true repentance, or am I in the church of God on my way out because I'm just too comfortable to care? <clears throat> How did Jonah respond to the questions posed by the book? Well, I want to provide some closure here. And it's not documented in the Bible, so I won't teach this as dogmatic theology. But it is widely accepted by biblical scholars that Jonah himself authored the book of Jonah. And when I read this book and I understand that it was the author himself writing this book, then you need to ask yourself, why would it be such an accurate, true account of his selfish attitude and hard heart if it was not for someone writing it as a testimony of what he once used to be, but through the mercy of God he now no longer is? So I want to give benefit to Jonah. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say Jonah got it in the end. Jonah understood the message, the experience of Jonah. He understood what God was trying to teach him. He got it. You see, God was saving both Nineveh and Jonah. And that gives us the final message from the book of Jonah. You may have heard that God does not call the qualified, but God qualifies the call. Have you heard that before? The book of Jonah teaches us that the calling is the only way in which the unqualified can become qualified. The calling is the only way in which the called can become the qualified. You see, if God has called you, and you put off, put off taking up that calling that God has given, you are missing out on the opportunity for God to fix what is broken in your life. Jonah did not do the Ninevites any favors. The Holy Spirit did it. But if Jonah did not go to Nineveh, he would not have allowed God the opportunity to fix him. How many of us are sitting here today and we know, we've been impressed, there's a brother, a sister, a neighbor, a friend, there are people that we need to be reaching out to. But we put off and we go sit in the shade and we wait for the city to burn. You are playing with your own salvation. That is the message of the book of Jonah. We cannot be sideline Christians. You're either in the fight or you're lost already. 
Brothers and sisters, the message of Jonah is not a storybook for kids. It is a clear and very serious message to all of us here today. If you're not in the calling, you're playing with your salvation. Now, just before we leave, all excited to go and witness and live out our calling. I can see everyone is thoroughly impressed today. I just want to caution on this one thing. We need to compare Jonah with another prophet we read of in the Bible, the prophet Balaam. Jonah is a prophet who was called by God and sent to a particular group of people to preach a specific God-given message. But Jonah ran the other way because of his selfish attitudes, and it's interesting to see how God uses an animal in this case, a great fish, to bring Jonah to his senses. Now, we contrast that with Balaam. Balaam was also a prophet, but he was not called by God. He wanted to bring a message to the people of God, but it was not a message of God. And again, God intervenes directly and threatens the life of this prophet, but God uses a donkey this time. And ultimately, Balaam is exposed as a prophet for profit. Now, why did I want to highlight this contrast? Because I want to caution. It is equally dangerous to neglect the task that God has given as to presume upon a task that God has not given. And why do I say this? Because when I was a young man, you think you can go and minister in the pubs and the clubs and where the girls are? That's putting yourself into temptation. That's not where God called you to minister. Don't go where your testimony will be undermined the moment you are there. But if you are in a situation and God is calling you to minister, then minister. But don't go and seek out questionable terrain and call that your ministry. Brothers and sisters, I pray that the, the book of Jonah may have provided us with new insights and perspectives upon how God works in our lives. And maybe it'll save us from that Messiah complex that sometimes develops, where I am the one who must go and save someone. No. But in going, God is saving you. And if you don't go, where does that leave you? Brothers and sisters, please, let's close our eyes and pray to the Lord and ask mercy because one man preached and 120,000 repented. And here we are, 2,000 in Singapore, in a city of 5 million. And we've been 2,000 for how long now? Isn't it time that our people went out and preached? Let's close our eyes. Dear Lord, the book of Jonah, on casual reading seems like a story, a fairy tale, too unbelievable to be true. Lord Jesus, but you, as always, you worked in the life of Jonah. These miraculous events took place and your Holy Spirit prevailed, saving 120,000 and one souls. Lord Jesus and I want to pray that while I am an unworthy servant, struggling to express the thoughts and the messages communicated through this book today, Lord, I want to pray that your Holy Spirit will do the work that I couldn't do. Lord, I want to pray, because that is the message I got from Jonah, is that I am irrelevant in preaching to your people. Your Spirit will take care of it. Lord Jesus, but if I didn't preach, then where would I be? And the question is for everyone sitting here today. God has impressed a calling. And if you don't know what that calling is, start with a general calling of go ye unto all nations. Start there. And let God use you not to save others, but to save you. Lord Jesus, I pray for your church. I pray for all gathered here today. I pray that your spirit will anoint us, that we can be a force of witness and testimony in Singapore. Lord Jesus, to the glory of your kingdom. 
Amen.